Mark 9, but is instead from Mark 1, verses 29 to 39. And immediately he, Jesus, left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Greetings to you. Greetings on this day that the Lord has made, a day for us to rejoice and be glad. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he, Jesus, said to them, Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. From his synagogue worship on the morning of the Sabbath to his interrupted prayer time the next morning, Jesus trashes the cultural religious narrative five times. In the Mediterranean world, of Jesus' day, everybody lived by the same narrative. The narrative established you in your position of honor or shame. Your honor or shame was your life. Honor delivered your social standing. Shame reduced your social standing. Both honor and shame were assigned by the social media of that day gossip. Wherever the women gathered, at the well waiting to fetch water, at the water and rocks washing clothes together, around the hearth making meals in one another's company, gossip was there and everywhere. And the men, whenever they gathered at the gate, taking note of everyone's comings and goings, welcoming the stranger, inquiring the news of other places. Whenever they worshipped after, whenever they fellowshiped after worship, gossip was there and everywhere. And if you think today's social media can get intense, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram can't hold a candle to the intensity and importance of gossip in those days of Jesus. The gossip assigned both honor and shame. The gossip established the narrative of your life as it accorded with the narrative of the community's life. Essentially, they were the same. Then along came Jesus. And Jesus trashed the narrative, not once, but five times in this little account, if you count last week's text as well, in this little account of a day in the life of Jesus. 
The established narrative said that Jesus was the son of a carpenter from Nazareth, and everybody knew that nothing good could come out of Nazareth. The narrative said that Jesus did not possess sufficient honor to speak in the synagogue, yet he did speak. In fact, his speaking astonished all in attendance. He spoke as one who had authority. That is one whose word could do things. That's what authority meant to the people of the day. Jesus astonished because he exhibited a claim to an honor the narrative had not ascribed to him. He trashed the narrative. Immediately, our text tells us, a demon in attendance called out in recognition of Jesus' identity, saying, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The, the demon knew the reason. By what power? Jesus spoke with authority. Jesus was the penultimate in those who possessed authority. That hierarchy began with a wide base, animals, humans. Third were angels, demons, and spirits. At the penultimate level were of that hierarchical pyramid stood those designated as sons of God, the holy ones of God, archangels, etc. At the pinnacle stood the one God, Almighty. Jesus immediately proves that he has this authority by commanding the demon to come out and be silent. That was the trashing, the second trashing, of the narrative. The narrative said no healing on the Sabbath, but there was Jesus healing on the Sabbath. A public trashing of that narrative. Jesus is on a roll. He goes with Simon and Andrew to their house. James and John go to Simon's mother-in-law has a fever. Jesus heals her again in violation of the Sabbath narrative. This third time, Jesus trashes the narrative in private among his in-group. The townspeople are more scrupulous in their Sabbath observance. They wait until the Sabbath is over at sundown and the next day begun before they gather in a vast crowd at the doorstep of the house. They all want something from Jesus, and Jesus accommodates and satisfies their desire for healing. As we continue with this day in the life of Jesus, we are confronted with his fourth trashing of the narrative. The narrative said, darkness was to be avoided. The narrative said, darkness was the cover for people who engage in shameful acts at night. Good, honorable people locked themselves in their homes, doors secured and windows shuttered. No one ventured out, especially alone, for fear of what the gossip might accuse them of. When day dawned, the doors, the windows were thrown open acknowledging that daytime was the appropriate time for activity and that the households had nothing to hide. So here's Jesus, getting up in the dark and venturing out. Venturing out alone. Venturing out alone and not telling anyone where he was going or what he was doing. Jesus really trashed that narrative, too. And finally, Jesus is in his self-chosen, deserted place praying when Simon and his party stumble on to him. 
They've been searching anxiously for him. Our English text gives us only a hint of Simon's frustration and exasperation. The Greek words are much more explicit in conveying that frustration and exasperation. Jesus is trashing Simon's narrative. Simon and the others had, no doubt, because they were sinners, begun building a narrative based on Jesus' demonstrated authority. Everybody wanted healing. Many, many people had demons or had loved ones who had demons. Jesus' authority had the potential of providing a lucrative business as the disciples sold access to him and built up a shrine comparable to the healing shrines of today, Our Lady of Lords, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, Our Lady of Fatima, and the other Marian healing shrines. Peter had visions of much honor coming his way through his association with Jesus' authority. But, but Jesus trashes Peter's narrative too. Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Jesus did not come out to be a wonder-working rabbi. He did not come out to have a shrine built around him and his authority doled out in dribs and drabs to those who paid for it. Jesus came out to be an itinerant preacher with a simple two-word message, repent, believe. Why? Because the kingdom of God was near at hand. So now we come to you, my friends in Christ. You are trained to be preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you explicitly headed for the public office of ministry where its preaching is your duty and your public responsibility. Others of you are headed to vocations where you will exercise the office of preaching by privilege and in private. I tell you, my friends in Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ is just as harsh to the established narratives of today as was its first preacher. To preach his gospel is to trash the narrative established by the law. <coughs> Excuse me. To trash the narrative established by the law, because the gospel brings salvation apart from and outside of the law. Salvation is in Jesus Christ, him crucified and him alone. You, as preachers of this gospel, trash the narrative of honor, glory, and triumphalism by replacing it with the narrative of Mary's Magnificat, upsetting the established order with, you replace it with the narrative of the Messiah dying naked and on the cross, the most shameful dying in all the world, all of that ancient world, and with the narrative of Paul, who regarded all things, even works of love, as liabilities when compared to Christ. They were no better than dumb. You who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ will expose your hearers in their desire to get something from Jesus. That desire taints their worship by what they expect to receive as benefit because receive as benefit in return. You who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, you speak for him. He has promised it. He has said, he who hears you, hears me. You, mouths of Christ, are sent out to be preachers. 
sent out by Jesus in the same way the Father sent him out. As Jesus trashed the narratives in your preaching of Jesus Christ, him alone and him crucified, you too will trash all the world's narratives by which it assigns honor. You will trash the people's narratives by which they seek honor and the benefit of it. You trash them so they can be replaced by a single narrative, Jesus' narrative. Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. He is the one who takes away the world's narrative, its story. He takes away the people's narrative, their story. He takes away your story. It comes to an end, and Jesus' story takes over. You no longer live, for Christ has become your life. He has delivered you out of your story, saved you apart from and outside of the law and all its narratives. Live now. A new story. A story heard fresh every day. Jesus' story. Thanks be to God. Amen.